everyone. Uh, welcome to Blue Oaks. I'm so glad that you're joining us here today as we continue our series in anger. Uh, my name's Lisa Harrington. I'm one of the pastors here. You know, we have a lot going on here at Blue Oaks, and you can see it all by clicking the latest news button on our website. Uh, and we have two incredible, exciting things happening this week, too. The first is Night to Shine registration is open. Night to Shine is an incredible prom experience for people with special needs in our community. And the prom isn't until 2023, but registration is open for both volunteers and participants. You know, it's a night, I'm telling you, it's a night you don't want to miss out on. So make sure that you register soon and tell your friends and your family, your neighbors. We got another awesome opportunity for you uh, for women. On December 3rd, we're going to have a, a special lunch for you. And we're going to have this amazing, amazing lunch that's going to be provided. At, but we need to know what your option is. So we need you to sign up so we know how much to get and that you're coming. Uh, so mark your calendars for December 3rd and look for more information. All right, let's jump into worship with Michaela. We worship the God who is We worship the God who is 
One day Jesus was trying to make a point about forgiveness and he did what he very commonly did when he taught. He told a story. Generally telling stories was the way Jesus taught about especially important things. I had a teacher in seminary who said, if you could ever give the perfect message, the whole thing would just be one story. And at the end of the story, you could just say to everyone, that's it, end of story, everyone go home. Well, Jesus would do that. He would be able to tell a story that would be so perfect, that would hit the truth so dead on that when he got to the end of the story, people knew exactly what decision they needed to make and how they ought to respond. And he could just say to them, that's it, end of story, everyone go home. And since I first started teaching, I've had the idea that one time in my life, I'm gonna do what Jesus did. One time, I'll make the whole message a single story. It's not this time, so don't get too excited. But I'm gonna come close. Today, I'm gonna come really close. I'm gonna retell a story Jesus told in the 18th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. This is a story about the head of a large company in a software corporation. Uh, he's the president and CEO. One day the time for the annual meeting comes around and all the vice presidents and department heads are called together. Uh, it's tax time for the Roman government. Caesar's IRS agents have been auditing the books going through them with a fine tooth comb because the Roman government had its own flat tax program. You pay your taxes or the Roman government will flatten you. That's kind of the way it worked. And it turns out that one of this guy's upper level employees, one of his VPs got caught with his hand in the cookie jar. He had been working for the CEO for a long time, but this VP had an Achilles heel. He wanted to maintain a lifestyle that he couldn't afford. And so he had been systematically embezzling from the company for years. And now he owes an astronomical amount of money. Jesus takes the largest number of, uh, in their language, and he pluralizes it to express the size of the debt that this guy owes. It would be like saying gazillions of dollars in English. There's no possible way this guy could ever pay it back. This is a story of plain, unadulterated, forget about tomorrow, greed. And Jesus says, now comes the day of reckoning. This guy gets a memo from the CEO. And so he goes to the boardroom and it's the day of the annual meeting. All the principal stockholders are there, all of his peers, uh, the vice presidents and department heads are there. And this crooked embezzler comes before the founder and principal owner and CEO of this company, the guy who believed in him, the guy who gave him his first chance, the man who trusted him. And this crooked embezzler has to admit his greed. He has to admit that he's uh, taken all of the money, that he had violated the trust of the one who employed him. Now you can imagine, as word of this got around, the kind of tremors that went through the whole corporation. Like everyone coming to the meeting who knew about this ahead of time must have thought to themselves, I mean, this is gonna be brutal. Imagine for a moment being this embezzler. Imagine his fear and utter sense of humiliation. His head is throbbing, his pulse is pounding, his palms are sweaty because it's over for him. No more bluffing. No more con games, no chapter 11, no chance to reorganize. He had no assets, no rich uncle, no horse that might pay off, no lotto tickets. I mean, he was finished. He was gonna be thrown in jail or he was gonna be sold into slavery. And not just him, the way it worked back then was his whole family would be sold into slavery. And not just for this generation, but for generations to come. You know, a slave was worth maybe $2,000. And so the sale of his whole family into slavery would not pay for one-tenth of 1% 1 of the debt. And that meant that he was facing slavery, not just for him and his wife and his children, but for his descendants for generations to come. So he stands now before his peers, before the stockholders, before the CEO, and in front of them all, the sentence is read. Sell everything he owns. 
sell him into slavery and sell his wife and sell his children and his children's children until this unpayable debt has been paid. Case closed, take him away, next item of business. Now at this point in Jesus' story, there have been no surprises. I mean, this is just standard operating procedure right out of the policy manual. But at this point, something happens in the mind of the embezzler, of this crooked guy. The reality of what he's done all of a sudden comes crashing down on him and the sentence registers in him and this idea comes to him. And he says to himself, like what if I were to fall on my face and humble myself and beg for mercy? I mean, it's a long shot. It, this is like the last ditch bolt out of the blue million and a one chance. But he reasons to himself, like, what have I got to lose? I have no other options. I'm out of hope. And so he does it. In front of them all, this guy falls on his knees. He gets on his face and he says, I'm guilty. I know what I owe, but I'm asking for mercy. I'll pay it back. I just need time. I just need you to give me a grace period. I just need some grace. Now imagine for a moment the others in the boardroom. They avert their eyes. They don't even want to look at this scene. I mean, they look down at their shoes. They, they're thinking to themselves, this is embarrassing. This guy sunk to a new low. I mean, he embezzled hundreds of millions of dollars and he knew the rules. He knew what would happen if he got caught. He knew he couldn't pay it back. He just, he's, he's got this penalty. This is just standard operating procedure. And now, you ask for mercy? I mean, even if you got mercy, even if you got time to pay it back in a thousand years, you couldn't pay this debt back. I mean, give me a break. Live in reality. Hello, clue phone, it's for you. Now, if these guys are surprised at this plea for mercy, imagine what happens when they look at the CEO. I mean, this guy is no pushover. He's been through the wars. I mean, he didn't get to be where he is by being an easy mark for every con man that comes along. But they look at him and he can't speak. He's all choked up. And they think to themselves, like, he's gonna fall for this? Like, like he's not gonna get soft on us now, is he? But as the CEO looks at this crooked embezzler and thinks about him and thinks about his family, something happens to his heart and his eyes get filled with tears. And although no one has ever seen anything like this before, his lips tremble as he begins to speak. Jesus says he feels compassion. He's just flooded with compassion for this crooked embezzler. And so for reasons no one understands, no one, he bends down and he takes him by the arm and he brings this embezzler to his feet. Get off your knees, he says. And then he rescinds the sentence. He says, you're not gonna be a slave. You're not gonna lose your family. You can keep what you owe. Only he goes beyond that in Jesus' story. He doesn't just rescind the sentence, he forgives the debt. The unpayable debt doesn't have to get paid back. This guy doesn't just get time to try to pay it back. The grace period will be extended indefinitely. He gives more grace than this embezzler had ever dreamt of asking for in his wildest dreams. Now, it's crucial that you understand this in order to get the story, in order to understand what Jesus is saying about God. When the owner forgave the debt, the debt just didn't disappear. It didn't just vanish. Who absorbed it? Who's gonna have to take the loss? The owner. When the owner forgives this embezzler, it costs him hundreds of millions of dollars. It's not a casual thing. He says, all right, I'll take the loss. You'll be forgiven for the debt. It will come out of my pocket. Now imagine the embezzler. He's saying, I can't believe it. I mean, I didn't have a prayer. This was a total long shot and it paid off. I threw myself on the mercy of the court and he took the loss and I got grace. It's all forgiven, I'm free. And he goes home to his wife and the two of them celebrate because they've gone from death to life. And now at this point, we need to step back from the story for a moment or two just to reflect on it. Now the master in this story, the CEO, he of course stands for God. 
The other main character in the story, the embezzler, the crooked guy, who is that? It's you and it's me. Jesus says you have accumulated a moral debt before a just and holy God and you've been adding to it for years. That's your condition and mine too. Every time you were less than honest, I mean, just think about that for a moment. Every time you fudged an expense account or tax return, every time you were unloving to a five-year-old, every time you should not have made a cutting remark, but you went ahead and made it, every time you should have spoken in love, but you refused to, every time you refused to be grateful, every time you gossiped, every selfish act, every racist joke, every sexually impure thought or deed, every judgmental attitude, every time you took a little grudge and you nursed it, you were adding to a mountain of moral debt. All human beings are in the same boat. We've accumulated a mountain of moral debt before a just and holy God, all of us have. You know, I'm a pastor. I've devoted my life to helping people understand and experience spiritual growth. And it took me about 30 seconds to come up with that list because I've done all of it. I mean, I've done those things or things that were just as bad or things that were worse. And so have you. I mean, if you're honest about it, so have you. If you'll be honest, and I hope that you will, in your heart today, as you examine your life, I mean, you know the truth about you. You are a fallen person. You have sinned and you have piled up a moral debt before a just and holy God. And that's not all. Further, the writers of scripture say, there is coming a day of reckoning. It's appointed to human beings. The writer of scripture says that, that we are going to die. We are gonna, it is appointed to human beings once to die and then comes judgment. Someday, as surely as I stand here in this room today, someday we're all going to face a moral audit of our lives. You are gonna face the fact that you owe an unpayable debt to a just and holy God. And further, you don't have the resources to pay it back. You cannot earn your way into God's good graces, not by going to church, not by uh, giving lots of money, not by doing good deeds. It's an unpayable debt. People often get confused about this. They think maybe if I could just be a good enough person or maybe if I could just go to church or maybe if I could be respectable, maybe that would be enough to pay off the debt. The writers of scripture are very clear that it doesn't work that way. But the writers of scripture say there is another way. You can throw yourself on the mercy of the court. The writers of scripture say God looked at you and he looked at me and was moved with compassion. And so God sent his son, Jesus, to this earth to teach us how to live and then to die on the cross, a death that by all rights, you and I should have died because of our sinfulness. The death that you should have died, the death that I should have died, the death that we deserve to die, he died instead on the cross. The writers of scripture say that on the cross, Jesus paid our debt. On the cross, he absorbed the loss so that you could be set utterly free. God really does forgive recklessly, extravagantly, with abandon, without regard to cost. And the place that ultimately expresses God's forgiveness is the cross. Now, this is absolutely essential to the story. You may be seeking God, and you may be under the impression that the way to God is by trying to be good, by trying to repay the debt yourself. And the writers of scripture say, just give it up. I mean, just give up the whole uh, moralistic pursuit. You just receive forgiveness as a gift. I mean, this is the absolute heart of the Christian faith. God by grace has forgiven you through the cross of Jesus Christ, and you simply receive it by faith. I know a guy who uh, wants his children to understand this concept of grace. And so every once in a while, they do something wrong and they should be punished, but he doesn't punish them because he wants them to remember that when they grow up someday, uh, when they're seeing their therapist someday, 
Like he wants them to remember that it's not all their dad's fault. And so every once in a while, he'll do this. He'll say, I'm not gonna punish you. And you know why I'm not gonna punish you? And they'll say, why? And he'll say, because of grace. And you know why I'm showing you grace? No, dad, why are you showing me grace? And he says, for no reason at all. There's never any reason for grace. If there was, it wouldn't be grace. There's never any reason for grace. His oldest son acted up one time. He went beyond the bounds, just transgressed in a serious way. And his dad was furious. He was ready to let him have it with a punishment that was very severe. And right at the moment, as he was about to apply punishment, his son looked him in the eye and said, Dad, can you cut me some grace? But he wasn't ready for that. And so he asked his son a question. Parents often do this. They'll ask questions when they're mad. They're not really looking for an answer. They'll say something like, like, what were you thinking when you did this? And of course, they don't wanna know what the child was thinking. There is no answer the child could give that would cause the parent to say, oh, well, now I understand your thought process. Okay, it's all right. Parents just do this kind of stuff just stupidly. Well, he asked his son this question, can you give me one good reason why I should cut you some grace? And his son said, dad, there's never any reason for grace. What are you gonna do with a kid like that? His dad cut him some grace. You see, God has decided, because he's God, that that's the kind of God he is. In his heart of hearts, what he longs to do most is just cut you some grace for no reason. Not because you're good enough, not because you go to church often enough, not because you're respectable enough, not because you give enough money, because there's never any reason for grace except just the gracious heart of God. That's why Jesus went to the cross and died and was raised again. But now you must decide what you're gonna do. You must receive it. You must make a decision. Maybe you haven't done that before. Maybe you now understand well enough that you know what's at stake. Maybe today is your day. It's the most important day of your life. I mean, this is your chance to say yes to God's offer of life and forgiveness. And all you have to do is say, God, I confess the fact that I'm a sinner, that I have a mountain of moral debt that I can't pay off on my own. And now I understand and receive your free gift of forgiveness through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross when he died in my place. And God, I wanna sign on with you. I want Jesus from this moment on to be my teacher, to be my savior, to be my Lord, to be my guide, to be my friend. That's what it means to be a Christian. And you can do that right now. Maybe for you, this is your day. The Bible is filled with stories of love and heartbreak, stories of great battles and mighty defeats, you know, stories of miracles and healings. And we hear these stories and, and we learn from these stories. And sometimes we hear these stories and we, we miss a main part or we pass over something that's important. And today we're talking about one of those stories, we're talking about David and Goliath. And many of us have probably heard about David and Goliath. You know, David's a boy who didn't have any power or might or respect and he defeats a literal giant. And when we talk about this story and we talk about David's courage and bravery, we talk about defeating our bullies or our problems. We talk about overcoming odds and identity. But what if the story wasn't about the person, but rather about the weapon? Today, Matt's talking to us about our ultimate weapon. And like David, our weapon may defy some of our assumptions or thinking. The story of David doesn't start with David. It starts with his brothers. His brothers are out in a field fighting giant men, and they're losing. I mean, it's not looking good for them at all. No one, no man's able to defeat this giant Goliath. And David struts in, he strolls in, and one thing leads to another, and we find David picking up tiny pebbles from a river for his slingshot. And that's what takes down the mighty Goliath, a slingshot. Swords couldn't do it, armies couldn't do it, but a slingshot could. You see, David's story is in part a story of weapon choice. No one thought David's weapon choice could or would work. They encouraged him to take up a sword, go with something else. 
Yet David knew, and he trusted in his weapon and his God. What was nonsensical and foolish led to victory for David and his people. In a minute, Matt's going to give us a weapon we can use for, for our anger. When we hear it, it may sound foolish. It may not seem like it could possibly even work. But like David, when we use and put into practice our small but mighty weapon, we can change ourselves and our community. So get ready, right? Let's be prepared to choose this new weapon. Now let's rejoin Matt to hear about this ultimate weapon against anger. All right, now this crooked embezzler has received grace, but that's not the end of the story. This is a, a two-part story that Jesus tells. The embezzler is off the hook. He owes his life, his freedom, his family, his possessions, everything to the grace of his master. He doesn't have to repay a cent. So everyone listening to the story wants to know, how is this guy gonna respond? I mean, what will his life look like in the second chapter? And he comes upon another guy, another employee in the corporation who owes him something, but this time it's a small debt. It's like $20. It's like pocket change to him. But this other guy doesn't have the money. He's a, a desperately poor man. And so he says to the embezzler, just wait until the end of the month. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna stiff you. As soon as I get my paycheck, I'll repay you what I owe you. Just give me some grace. He asks for grace. In fact, this is part of Jesus' amazing mastery of storytelling. In this story, the poor guy uses exactly the same words with the embezzler that the embezzler used to beg, to this, to beg the CEO for grace. Jesus said, he fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you what I owe. Same words. The great difference, of course, is that this time it's doable. This is just a small debt. It's repayable. It's finite. And everyone waits to see how this guy's going to respond. And this former embezzler, this cheat, who was forgiven everything, thinks to himself, I'm not going to make the same mistake the CEO made with me. I'm not going to get stuck with it. I'm going to make him pay. And he says to the guy on his knees before him with dry eyes, no tremble in his lips, no compassion in his heart. He says, don't think I'm gonna fall for that. I mean, don't make me laugh. What kind of sucker do you think I am? And he takes this poor man and grabs him by the throat and begins to choke him and has him thrown into prison where of course he cannot hope to repay the debt because this forgiven embezzler refuses to pay the price. He will not forgive the debt. He says in his heart, I'm gonna make you pay. You see, here's the truth about forgiveness. Authentic, authentic forgiveness is never cheap. When you get hurt and the hurt is deep and the hurt is unfair, you want the other person to hurt back. You want them to know the pain that they've inflicted on you. You want them to pay. And I know what that feels like. I'm sure you do too. Especially if you've been hurt in unjust, deeply unfair ways. We just want the other person to pay. It's human nature. The LA Times had a story a while ago about a guy named Dave Hackler, who among other things was a part-time umpire at a recreational baseball league. And he tells a story about how he was driving too fast in the snow in Boulder, Colorado, and a policeman pulled him over and gave him a, a speeding ticket. And he tried to talk out of it, talk his way out of it. He begged for mercy. Um, have you ever done that with a police officer? The equivalent of falling on your knees and begging for mercy. He told him how he was worried about his insurance and how he normally was a very safe driver, but he was in a hurry. And the police officer told him that if he didn't like the ticket, he could uh, go to court. So fast forward to the first game of the next baseball season. Dave is umping behind home plate. Guess who the first batter up is? It's the police officer who gave him the ticket and they recognize each other. And the police officer said, so how did the thing with the ticket go? And Dave told him, you better swing at everything. <laughs> and this is just human nature, isn't it? Like, wouldn't you love to be able to do something like that? It's like this dream scenario. If you get hurt by someone, 
Wouldn't you love to be able to end up in their world one day as like the umpire over their life? You would be able to say, you better swing at everything. You see how you like it? You see how it feels to be the victim of injustice? You know, maybe you've been royally used and abused. Maybe you've been cheated or betrayed or deeply wounded. Maybe you've been in a financial situation where someone has raked you over the coals and they did it deliberately and they did it with malice and you know it. Maybe you've been in a situation at work where you've been the recipient of grossly unfair treatment. Maybe you've been in a relationship where you gave your trust to someone and they betrayed you. You've been hurt and the hurt is deep and it's personal and it's unfair and it's caused resentment to build in you. Someone has run up a moral debt with you and you know like every last penny they owe. And you're saying right now, as you sit there listening to this, yeah, but if, if I forgive him, I, I know what that means. It means I'm gonna have to swallow the debt. It means I'm gonna have to pay the cost. And the cost is not making them hurt back not even uh, getting, getting revenge, it's just letting it go. And you're right. If you forgive someone, you pay a high cost. In fact, there's only th one thing in the world that I know of that costs more than forgiving someone. You know what it is? It's not forgiving someone. Because non-forgiveness costs in your heart. And you may know that. Like you've got to forgive. It doesn't mean you condone what someone did that was wrong. Forgiving is not condoning. It doesn't mean you excuse what someone did. Forgiveness is not the same thing as excusing someone. It doesn't mean you decide you'll tolerate injustice. Forgiveness does not mean tolerating injustice. Forgiveness does not mean uh, that you always reconcile with the other person. Sometimes you can't recognize, reconcile. It, like if the other person is not willing to acknowledge their part, if they're not willing to confess and repent when they've wronged you, then you can't reconcile. You can't build a relationship safely unless it's built on truth. Forgiving someone does not mean condoning them. It doesn't mean ex excusing them. It doesn't mean uh, tolerating injustice. It doesn't even always mean reconciling but you can always forgive because forgiving someone means you let go of your right to hurt them back. You let go of your desire to see them hurt. You let it go. And this takes time and it's a process. Sometimes you have to do it over and over and over, but eventually your heart will begin to heal and God will begin to give you new eyes and you'll come to see that person who hurt you as not just a monster, but as a fallible fallen human being. And eventually you'll be able to wish them well, to hope good things will happen to them. And then you'll know that you are well on your way to forgiving them. It costs a lot to forgive, but to not forgive costs you in your heart. Don't forgive, and you will become filled with anger and resentment. Don't forgive and bit by bit, all the joy will get choked out of you. Don't forgive and bit by bit, by bit you will be unable to trust anyone ever again. Don't forgive and the bitterness will crowd out the compassion in your heart, slowly, utterly, forever. And you'll just be one long complaint don't forgive, and that little grudge that you nurse will grow larger and stronger. And although you think that you can hide it from everyone that you know, in time, it will become a monster of hostility, and one day it will kill you. And all that will be left out of once that was a person will just be bitterness and anger. And from the story Jesus told, what we learn is the only power to forgive lies in the experience of being forgiven. The only thing that gives fallen, fallible human beings the power, the strength to extend grace to someone who doesn't deserve it is the experience of being released from a mountain of moral debt in the eyes of a just and holy God. 
And if you live in that kind of forgiveness, then how can you refuse to extend it to someone else? The only power to forgive lies in the experience of being forgiven. And therefore today, at the end of this series, I can offer you nothing but the cross of Christ. No clever principles are clever enough. No simple steps are simple enough. Just the cross. For the cross is the place where we see the ultimate expression of the heart of God. The cross is God's ultimate weapon against the anger and hostility the hurt and the hate and the sin that would otherwise destroy the human race, just the cross, only the cross. And so I offer you nothing today but the cross of Christ. And now there's one more part to the story. And to be real honest with you, I kind of wish there wasn't because this part is a very frightening part, has frightening implications. But you know, it's not my story and so I can't leave it out. This embezzler has done the unthinkable. Uh, he claimed forgiveness from God for an infinite mountain of moral debt, but he refuses to extend forgiveness and grace to another person who uh, is a fallen sinner just like him. He claims to receive this huge forgiveness of his debt, but he refuses to extend it to just a little one. And the tale of this second encounter spreads through the whole corporation. Everyone's buzzing about it. And eventually, Word gets back to the CEO. And by this time in the story, it ought to be pretty clear to you that this CEO doesn't miss much. I mean, he's a pretty sharp guy. And so this ex-embezzler is brought into the boardroom a second time for another exchange. But it's a different story this time around. In this interview, there are no tears, there are no pleadings, there's no falling on the ground, no begging for mercy, no bargains. This time, the CEO looks at this embezzler and says, you didn't get it at all, did you? It didn't penetrate. You have gravely misunderstood me, my friend. You thought that grace meant I was some incompetent leader who would let you get away with whatever you wanted and abuse whomever you wanted. You thought because you had gotten in with me, you could be the same hurtful, self-centered, arrogant, unforgiving, ungracious person that you were before. You were badly mistaken. I was willing to take the loss for you. I would be still, but you don't want what I offer. You were shown forgiveness, but you wouldn't give it. You were offered grace, but you wouldn't extend it. You were showered with love, but you refused to live in it. I offered you the miracle of forgiveness, the chance to live in a world of grace instead of this, you hurt me, I'll hurt you back, I'll make you pay kind of world. But you can't receive it yourself and deny it to others. It's a package deal. You've rejected what I have given to you and I have nothing left to offer. And then this CEO turns and addresses the officers, take him away, throw him in the prison, leave him there until he shall pay back the unpayable debt. End of interview, beginning of sentence. And then Jesus says these very sobering words, and this is how my heavenly father will treat every one of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart, unless you forgive him from your heart. And now you must choose. No more explaining. Now you've got to choose. Vengeance or mercy? Prison or freedom? Hatred or grace? Death or life? Now it's up to you. So please, please choose to forgive. For God's sake, forgive before it kills you. Let it go. Choose life. End of story. That's it. You can go home. All right, let me pray for you. God, I pray that um, some people would say this prayer. God, would you forgive me for my sin, for the mountain of debt that I've piled up over the course of my life? I receive Jesus into my life. I receive the payment that he paid on the cross for my sin so that I can be free so that I can be forgiven. And God, because we've done that, because we've received your grace for this mountain of debt that we owe, I pray that you would help us to treat the people in our lives who have hurt us with that same kind of grace. God, help us to forgive. 
God, would you free us from maybe the prison that we've put ourselves in because we're not willing to forgive. Help us to take a step toward forgiveness and grace with people in our lives. And God, would you just do this miracle of shaping us and freeing us and molding us into the kind of people that you want us to be in this world. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like to rewatch this service or share it, click on demand on our website 
And as always, let us know how we can be praying for you via the, the prayer tab. If you want to partner with us financially, you'll also find the give button there too. All right, so we'll see you next week, all right? Take care.